Hey, Charlie. My name is Caden Smith. Um, big fan of yours. So at my college campus, we have about five people in my Turning Point chapter. So what is your greatest advice to uh, combat against people tearing down your table, breaking into your dorm room, and all this other crazy stuff? Wow. What school again? I'm sorry. Mid Plains Community College okay. in North Platte, Nebraska. So I'm, I'm sorry you have to deal uh, with the, boy, breaking into your dorm room. That's, uh, that's I don't hear that one often. Uh, first, how do you deal with it? Attitude-wise. This is another thing they don't teach you in college. How do you handle negativity and suffering? No. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. Do you complain? Or do you look at it as a potential blessing in your life? You are 100% in control of the attitude that you bring to things that are out of your control. Secular society and modern society says that you are a victim of your circumstances. I'm here to tell you that you get to choose how you handle your circumstances. And so, for example, okay, our table gets torn down. They break into your dorm room. You have two choices. I'm a victim feel sorry for me. I want special rights and privileges. Number two, wow, this is making me tougher. I'm going to grow closer to the people I care about. Our five chapter members are going to be tighter knit than ever before. I'm going to have some great stories. And boy, I'm more motivated to defeat these Marxists than I was before I started my turning point group. Boom, mindset shift. You have a choice to do that. And our society now is nonstop about something. You are just a creation of the stuff. No, you are a creation of who you choose to be. You are a creation of the mindset you bring to the game. And so, yeah, bad stuff can happen to you. Sickness, death, unexpected car crashes, injury. Do you view it as a chance to become better or not? How many people have read Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl? Anybody? Well, that's actually more hand. I think some of you want to ask questions, so I can't tell. Uh, you should all read Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, Holocaust survivor. No one can say that I'm suffering and then read Viktor Frankl's book. The guy lost his wife, concentration camp survivor, and he says, if you go through life with an attitude that this is a chance to improve and become a better person, you have the agency to do that. And so how do you handle it? Look at it as a blessing. Get tougher, get stronger as a chance to grow your impact. And I will say this again. If you're involved with Turning Point USA, the maggots will attack you. Good. You will become stronger while your counterparts grow weaker. Next question. Where are we at? I have no Mr. idea. Mr. Kirk, in the center here. Okay. I'll stand up. Mr. Kirk, how do we ascend to your level of basedom? And also, um, based them? Yes, being the that being based essentially. How do we make time in our busy, or how would one make time in their busy schedules for? Uh, the pursuit of wisdom okay. and that sort of thing. Can I? Or th great question. What school do you go to? I am the only member here from Westfield State University in Massachusetts. Well, God bless you for being here. I have no idea where that is in Massachusetts, but that any far west you get to Albany. So even further west than Worcester. Okay. Well, okay. Yes. All right. God bless you. Thanks for being here. I'm going to say this as um, non braggadociously as a human being can. You guys are not busier than I am. Okay. I'm just going to be honest. We got 400 employees. I got to raise $100 million a year. I do three hours of radio. I have a daughter, a wife, and I got to deal with the New York Times and whatever government agency wants to put me in prison. Okay? If you're busier than me, I want to meet you. You make time for what you care about. Podcasting. Wake up earlier. Stop doing drugs. Stop drinking. Listen to podcasts that matter or Hillsdale online courses, whatever it is. You're not busy. You think you're busy. If I told you that your life will end in 30 days unless you run a mile, run, run for, walk for an hour a day, you'd find time to do that. It's a matter of what matters most to you. So you're probably going to have to subtract something from that equation, okay? The easy stuff to sub subtract, here's a super easy equation, okay? You could do your own audit. Are you spending time with people that gossip more than pursue beautiful things? If yes, stop being friends with those people. Waste of time. Number two, are you looking at a screen of content that is not teaching you things or fulfilling things? Stop it. 
Do you have social media apps on your phone? You shouldn't. Number four, are you doing substances that do not make you feel good after you do them once the high wears off? Stop doing those substances. If you're doing those four things and you tell me you're busy, you're not busy. You're distracted. It's a big difference. And so what my advice to you is you carve out the time. Hillsdale Online Courses, Char charlieforhillsdale.com. You listen to the Charlie Kirk Show. Listen to the Matt Walsh Show. Listen, uh, there's uh, Vic Victor Davis Hanson stuff. Like, there's, um, I could give you 100 books, literally 100 books to read that you guys could dive into, but you have to want it. It's going to take a 1,000 hours of study within a couple years. But here's the cool thing. Once you go on this, there is no greater joy except getting married, having kids, and giving your life to Jesus. So, like, no, no greater, like, daily joy. Like, no, no greater daily joy than learning. The first line of Aristotle's metaphysics, all men desire to know. Dive deep. Challenge yourself. Read the great books. You'll start to get to a level of joy and understanding of wisdom that I think our generation is missing. Yes. Thank you so much for being here with us uh, today. So you mentioned how it's maybe not a good idea to go into law, but I'm someone who really enjoys law and I want to go to law school and uh, be a constitutional lawyer. And I think we owe a lot to conservative judges like Scalia, Alito, Thomas, even Rehnquist from the 70s. So do you think it's better to not abandon these fields and instead try to take over them? Um, as we see, the law has an effect on our daily lives, seen through recent uh, Supreme Court decisions and even through COVID. And what advice would you give to someone who wants to go into law and who's a super staunch conservative? No, I mean, look, if you have the temperament and the self-discipline, go do it. I, I, I wouldn't be able to go through forced diversity, equity, inclusion courses at a law school. That's what you're going to have to do, right? To go to a respectable law school, you're going to have to write paper after paper on why the Constitution is trash. I wouldn't be able to do that. So more power to you if, if you're willing to write that and do that. The top, every law school is captured, basically every single one. But you're right. We do need to have people go into elite society that actually love the country and share our values. But everyone's wired differently. I personally would not be able to go through that kind of humiliation exercise against my deeply, deeply held beliefs. But yes, you, I mean, Amy Coney Barrett, Kavanaugh, Gorsuch is whatever, Scalia is amazing. We, we, we need a new wave of conservative legal scholars, and you seem like the type of person who needs to do it. So I'll back you 100% in that effort. God bless you. Great Charlie, on your left, right here. Guy standing up right here. All right. So, Charlie, my name's Charlie as well. I'm from Seattle, Washington. Uh, so, we are in the middle of a huge culture war, and I really enjoy the point of view that every chapter is its own military base. And so, every war needs a game-winning strategy. And so, Charlie, as one of our great generals, what's our game-winning strategy? All right, so, it's going to be a long war, let me tell you that. This is not going to end by, you know, the break of summer, to use a military analogy. Number one. You do not apologize to the bad guys unless you know you've done something wrong. You do not apologize to the bad guys by forced Maoist-style indoctrination. Number two, you never surrender to their will. Number three, you must be happy. Happiness is a choice. You're like, what? Do you know ha happiness does not happen to you? You need to work on your happiness. You need, yeah, that is, that's Prager's book, Happiness is a Serious Problem. It will change your life as soon as you recognize that. Happiness does not happen to you. You choose to be happy. And if your college is not teaching you that, your college is doing a big disservice to you. Why, why does happiness and joy matter? Because they'll never be able to take that from you if you decide that's who you're going to be. Ever. And I, again, I believe the true joy comes from relationship with the Lord. You, you, I hope you guys make that same decision. And so we must be joyful warriors. What is the battle plan? More than even law. I'm so glad you're doing that. But we need entrepreneurs. We need some of you guys to go start the next Google, the next Salesforce, the next Ford Motor Company. We need that badly. Can one of you go become a billionaire in the next five years? And we'll have a lot to talk about, okay? Like somebody go found conservative Snapchat or something and like come back in five years, I'll name the whole chapter leadership summit after you, okay? 
Yeah, I won't have a problem with that 100 million a year. Right, exactly. One of you, please go get fabulously wealthy very quickly because we need our own George Soros. Okay? What is the battle plan? We need you guys to go take risks and not just go work for people, but go employ people and go get very rich and then go give money to go defeat the maggots. Okay? That, so I, I got a lot more to that. But, and then finally, in your own personal life, you need to be personally conservative. Men, stop watching pornography. Women, stop watching pornography because a lot of women are watching pornography. Stop doing drugs, get married and save yourself for marriage and then have Mormon levels of children and then get rich and donate them back to Turning Point USA. Okay. Hi, Charlie. And go to the Men's Summit is right. Yes. Okay, so this is actually a really perfectly timed question for that response. Um, it's about mindset. It's about happiness. Last summer I was assigned a book for a class. Another reason to hate college with this one. It was called uh, Bright Sided, Why Positive Thinking is Undermining America. I had to read this book. It was torture. Uh, the general assertion is that being hopeful, being positive, being happy, being satisfied with things, being grateful are toxic and are undermining America in a variety of ways that she went in the book, all to make the not very subtle assertion that it's conservatives because of all the data out there that we're too happier. happy. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to know what your response is and why – one of the main points is that we don't, like, demand enough. We're not progressive enough. We don't want more entitlements. Um, but I think we demand a lot in, in like, a higher standard, not in, like, yes. handouts. I wanted to know, like, your thought on that assertion, that book that I had to read for a okay. class. Okay. So first of all, you should – before you ever – this is a good life lesson. Before you ever demand anything from your society or your government – or from others, you must demand excellence from yourself. Before you ever demand anything from society or others, you must demand excellence from yourself. If you are unshaven and like waking up at 5 a.m. and doing drugs and being like, the world is so unjust, give me free stuff, like get your act together before you start to go tell other people to give up their liberty, freedom, and their stuff, okay? So I wanna be very clear. Positive thinking has a bad rap in some way. I think we should be accurate thinkers, but you should also understand that your attitude is 100% in your control. 100%. The unhappy make the world worse. The person who wrote that book is making the world worse. But if you're a secular leftist, what do you have to be happy about? Everything the left focuses on is a crisis that is unhappy. The world is ending from climate change. The world is ending from systemic racism. There is no God. Our history sucks. I would be unhappy too. We look at it like, okay, no, there's not a climate catastrophe. We're not systemically racist. We're the greatest nation ever to exist. And I'm made in the image of God, of God who loved me enough to say, send his, his son so that I could live eternal life. Yeah, that would bring me a lot of joy, actually. And so, but... I don't love that term positive thinking because people think of it as like delusional thinking where, you know, as Tony Robbins would say, you don't go into your garden and say, there's no weeds, there's no weeds, there's no weeds. You go into your garden, you say, here's the weed and let me pull it out so that you could live a better life and fix your thinking patterns. And so we, Andrew Tate said this, I'm not an apologist for Andrew Tate, by the way, I think he's got a lot of problems, but I think he was totally right when he said this. All the young men are like smiling now because this is, yeah, yeah, no, I, uh, I, I can't hear what you said, but okay, yeah, again, I'm not, not an apologist of Andrew Tate, but I think he was right when he said this, which is that society in general wants you depressed and they don't want you happy. That if you're happy and joyful, people act as if there's something wrong with you. But if you're depressed and angry or bitter, they're like, everything's right with you. That's weird. And totally understanding that depression is a real thing and that people can struggle with it and anxiety is a real thing, totally get it. Happy to give you resources on that. However, your attitude is still a choice and how you act is a choice every single day. Only you are to blame for whether you are happy or unhappy today. That is completely on you, not on systemic racism, colonialism, misogyny, homophobia, or somebody calling you a bad name. Next question. Hey, Charlie, uh, just want to start off by saying really big fan, but uh, 
I'm trying to do a, a co-event with a, the student ministry I'm in, and the uh, president is very adamant about not combining faith and politics. He is conservative, but he, you know, he separation of church and state. He doesn't want to make it political, basically. So, like, what are some ideas that I can propose to him to uh, to where we can do a co-event? Yeah, I mean, you should ask him where does it say separation of church and state in the Constitution, and that would make him make him fluster a little bit. Um, I'm pretty outspoken on this topic, as you can imagine. Y your friend is wrong. What he's basically saying is he doesn't want to offend people. Well, look, the gospel is offensive, okay, by definition. And th look, what is politics? Politics is how we decide who gets power. The Bible has a lot to say about that. The Bible is largely a political document. What is true? What is good? Should we protect children? Who gets power? Should it be separate? The Founding Fathers quoted Deuteronomy more than any other book, religious or secular, in the formation of our government. And so I understand campus ministry. They're like, oh, we just want to focus on the gospel. You are a weak person. Good luck with your nine people. How many campus ministries can get 6,000 people to show up to an event like we can this weekend? They can't. They're withering away. They're dying. Their membership is going down. Why? Because they're increasingly irrelevant, where they're like, we just want to love everyone. Meanwhile, this trans zealotry is spreading the country, and they're like, well, we don't take stances on that stuff. Well, you're going to be irrelevant, and your numbers are going to go down. If you stand for truth, people will come. If you stand for truth, people will come. Happy to talk more privately with you, though. Thank you. On your left? Yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Jude Carlson, unfortunately not related to the notorious Tucker Carlson, but um, I come from a pretty conservative area, uh, but my fellow high schoolers don't exactly have motivation for politics or getting involved at all. So as having the privilege of being the president of the first chapter at my high school, what would you recommend me do to have the largest impact that I can and uh, encourage my peers uh, to be leaders while simultaneously leading them to Christ? This is a, a question I get from people of all ages, which is someone who cares asking me, why do other people not care? It's just the way that God made us. A small percentage of the population will care while most people sit idly by and do nothing. It's just the way it is. So the trick and the challenge of the leader is how do we get those who usually won't care to care? That's the challenge in front of all of you. And the number one way is you yourself have to be joyful, enthusiastic, energetic, and you have to be a leader that is worth following. If you are those things, then you have a chance to bring other people into those ranks, right? But again, the majority of the population is just gonna be indifferent, eh, whatever. How many times do you guys hear that when you do this? Oh, whatever, I don't care. Whatever, I don't care. You're going to have to just break through that, pierce through that, try to make it relative, try to make it relevant, I should say, try to make it engaging, informational. But more than anything else, people follow people. And so if you are a leader worth following, who's interesting, who studies, who understands their stuff, that's a great way to pierce through a lot of the cynicism and a lot of the lack of engagement. God bless you, man. Thank you for leading our chapter two. Frank Reynolds. Hey, Charlie, my name is John Walker. I'm the pr chapter president at Grand Canyon University chapter. Yeah, um, nice to see you again. Um, so I had a question similar to the question that was asked over here, but with GCU being like a Christian campus, pretty conservative campus, there are a lot of students that I talk to, especially friends of mine that are like, hey, I, like, I respect what you're doing. I don't really care about politics. All I care about is the gospel. You know, Jesus is going to win in the end, so why should I care about America? I hear that same thing from a lot of churches, too. So how do you suggest I go about going into these friend circles, going into these churches, and be like, hey, you should care about America because we know Jesus is going to, you know, come back and those believers are going to be saved. But, like, why should we care in the moment now? Great, great question. First and foremost, does the Bible ever instruct us to care about politics? Yes. Jeremiah 29, 7, demand the welfare of the nation that you are in because your welfare is tied to your nation's welfare. Daniel, Esther, Mordecai, Jeremiah, Nehemiah. I could go through the list. Joseph. Joseph, one of my favorite characters of the Bible. Who? Bible trivia. Only two Old Testament characters called righteous are who? Anybody? Noah. Who said that? 
Good for you. And? No, no, Abraham was never called righteous. No, it's, it's, it's uh, Noah and Joseph. Abraham was called good, but he's not called righteous. But close, though. Yes, who said, whoever said Noah, that's really good for you. Uh, that, that you people usually, I, I've been to churches and they don't get that question right. Um, so Joseph called a righteous man. He was also called handsome. That's a separate issue. Joseph was what? What was Joseph? Let's Bible trivia. How could you describe Joseph? Yes, he was young, son, discarded, all this. What was his role in Egypt? Anybody? Second most powerful, but what he was a what? He was, what'd you say? The accountant. Accountant, yes, but he was a counselor to the king, right? God's vision for his people is to be counselors to the king, to correct error into right, to correct lies into truth, right? So should we delete, should we take scissors and remove Joseph, Daniel, Mordecai, Esther, Nehemiah, and Jeremiah? No, we should look to Daniel. What did Daniel do when a tyrannical government told him to stop praying. What did Daniel do? Pray. Kept praying and he opened up the window and he said, screw you, I'm going to keep on worshiping Hashem, Adonai, Jehovah, Elohim. I am not going to listen to your tyrannical order. We talk about Daniel in the lion's den, but we forget how he got in the lion's den. He got in the lion's den because he did not put up with tyrannical government. What does it say in Acts? It says that we will not obey man but we will obey God. I could go on and on and on and on. This is a luxury of modern Christians that are comfortable and cowards. You, don't, you shouldn't say that, but I'm being honest, okay? These are modern Christians that have it so good, they don't understand that Christianity usually ends up in the gulag and the death camp and persecution. If we do not stand and fight for liberty, which is God's idea, not man's idea, we will be having theological disputes from prison, and we're all going to be running prison ministries. But if we are, stand for self-government and the promise the founders handed down to us, there's a chance that we can continue to fight for righteousness, righteousness and goodness. And think about how selfish it is, though. Oh, Jesus is coming. I don't need to go fight for other people. What were the two things that Jesus said were the most important teachings of the Old Testament? Leviticus 19, which is? Love your neighbor as yourself. You guys do that. Yeah, this is an impressive group. And number two, Deuteronomy 20, which is? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Good. Uh, so, those two things. How can you love your neighbor as yourself if you live under a tyrannical government? I love, exactly, I love my neighbor so much, I want them to live in a free society. That's what you should tell your friends. That is, ex it is the loving thing to do, to give someone a free society. It is the unloving thing. It is against Leviticus 19. It is against what Jesus told us is the greatest thing, to have them live in a Stalinistic, Mao-type government. So take whatever you want, maybe lower the temperature a little bit, and then park it and say, maybe we should think about this. And finally, liberty is to be able to do what you ought to do. We have this short gasp where we live in a free society. Does God want you to be free? Yes. God delivered his chosen people from bondage. The first, the first chapter of Exodus. And then rose a king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Forgets the memory of the history before them. Terrorized. Who are these Jews? Imprisoned them. Enslaved them. They multiply like cockroaches. And God went to great lengths to deliver his people from bondage, from tyranny, into freedom. But then what ends up happening? Anybody read the book of Numbers? Numbers 11? They start complaining. And they complain. And they complain. And they complain. And they complain. Numbers 11, God's chosen people. Ten plagues. Parting of the Red Sea. Ten commandments. Numbers 11, what was their complaint? Hey God, we want to go back to Egypt because we had, quote, cucumbers in Egypt. You can look it up. Fact check me. English Standard Version, Numbers 11. They've said to God, we miss Egypt because we had meat, leeks, and cucumbers and melons in Egypt. That's a good trivia question for your friends, right? Name me a vegetable that is in the book of Numbers. Many people don't know. It's cucumbers. It's like hilarious. What were they saying? I prefer to go be a slave than to be in the desert, even though quail is blown off course and manna comes from heaven. It is in our soul and our broken spirit to want to be taken care of and live under tyranny. It takes effort, effort of you to want to live free, to want to remind people that liberty and freedom is a value, which is God's plan for his people. 
our broken nature wants us to go live under a dictator. That is the spiritual tension in front of us right now. Next question. To your right. Yep. Holy base. Let's go. Now, I just want to say, for all Catholics and curious, we will be doing a rosary tonight. We're trying to get a group together. Out there. I have a lot of respect for Catholics. God bless Let's you. We can go. But anyway, please join. We would love for everyone to come. But so what I want to know is... Um, so I would argue that Turning Point's rhetoric has gotten a lot better since the Culture War tour back in 2019. And a lot of the arguments that have gone on within my chapter have been about what is Turning Point's real goal. You know, people will tell me, at least, they'll say, oh, this is all about economics, Gus. You can't focus on the social issues. And obviously, I think this discussion is proving that wrong right now. But I kind of want to, just because the rhetoric has shifted so much over the last few years, I want to know what is, like, Turning Point's definitive stance on social issues, both political, religious, and also how does that go into factoring in who can work at Turning Point USA? Like, what is the standard for, you know, what someone should be practicing in their personal Well, I, I think that's a great question. And so first, I'll tell you what I believe, right? I think it's rather well documented. I think I've just gone through it, right? The most important way that I could address that is first and foremost, an understanding of the principles that allowed Western civilization to flourish and a commitment to the eternal natural law. We go back to the Declaration and the Constitution. First and foremost, the laws of nature and nature's God. How you read that and how I read that is there is a natural law and we should follow that. So if I were to, because you could go through a million different issues, right? And then all of a sudden you have like, you, your mission statement ends up being 500,000 pages long. So I made a decision. I said, you know what? We had this at our training. We believe in the promises of the Declaration of the Constitution, which does cover social issues, by the way. The Declaration, God has mentioned four times that there is a supreme judge of the world. Right? And so if you stay to just those two documents, what is Turning Point's mission? To revive the promise of the American founding as articulated in the Declaration and the United States Constitution, a.k.a. get our country back from these people. <laughs> now, you might say, Charlie, oh, you know, you, you're ramping up the intensity. What has changed? I got married and had a daughter. That's what's changed. You want to get radicalized? Get married. With that being said, some of our, some of our best activists, some of our, you know, Hardest fighters in the trenches are people with other lifestyles and that. You know what? I think the world of them. And I'm happy to fight for liberty amongst people, even if I see differently on certain things that they might do in their personal life. So to answer that final part of your question. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Kirk. My name is Abby Ball Hagen, and I am one of the co-presidents at Pepperdine University. You Pepperdine, yeah. You answered my question last time about um, becoming a surgeon and also a mom at YWLS. Oh, uh, that went a little viral. <laughs> it did. Um, but thank you for reposting on your page. It was course, super cool. You. My family sent it to me, cool. and they were like, whoa. But anyway, I have a bit of a different question. Sure. So at Pepperdine, there's a really big organization that's called the Global Justice Institute, and they're currently serving in Rwanda and Uganda, breaking people out of prison for crimes that they actually did not commit. However, I joined as an ambassador to only advocate for Palmia negotiations in foreign countries because that's something that I'm actually passionate about. I'm not necessarily passionate about the humanitarian acts. I don't really have anything to do with our country. Yeah. So how, and there are many organizations at Pepperdine that are kind of conservative and also kind of liberal just because they have to swing both ways to have both sides of Christianity be service like some of the students were sure. saying so how should we as conservatives conservative students support these organizations should we go all in and try to really maximize that conservative side or just not at all because they're not fully conservative yeah i mean it, it depends I, I have nothing against helping people in you know uganda or rwanda I, I i do how do i say this gently there's a lot of good people that do that work but I also think it's driven a lot by upper middle class white guilt in this country, where they refuse to actually recognize our own country as quickly becoming a third world country. Like, get on a highway, any highway, and drive through the interior of the United States. We have 110,000 people drug overdosing every single year in this country. We have thousands of people being sex trafficked, literally, through our country every single day. We're like, oh, I need to go to Rwanda or Uganda. Like, nah, okay, good on you. But do you focus at all on your own country? Jeremiah 29, 7, demand the welfare of the land of which you are in. Not demand the welfare of a foreign off land. I'm not against it. I'm sure they mean well, but I'm with you. Like, can we fix our own country before we try to solve the ailments of the third world? I, I, I just, I, I don't know. So how do you, I would involve 
the, the Palmia thing is really important. The prisoners of war missing in action. I'm glad you're doing that. So that's what my own sentiment is that I'm not against, you know, international third world charity, but I feel as if it's been an overemphasis of Christian groups the last 20 or 30 years. And there's kind of an indifference with the suffering that's happening in our own country.